It was as though God had decided to design the perfect baseball player. With broad, powerful shoulders, an arm like a cannon, and speed that smaller men couldn't begin to touch, Mickey Mantle was a natural. His home run blasts didn't just go into the stands, sometimes they left the park altogether. He wasn't an especially big man, but the power and bat speed he generated when swinging at a baseball resulted in mammoth home runs. Ted Williams declared that the crack of the bat against the ball when Mantle connected was like an explosion. Had he played for a team with a smaller stadium rather than in New York, where their cavernous center field turned home runs into easy putouts, and had he stayed injury free, he might easily hold the record for career home runs today. As it was, he still managed to finish his career with stats that were none too shabby. Nominated to the All Star team 16 times, eighth on the all time home run list, Mantle played in 12 World Series and holds the record for the most home runs in World Series play. Mantle seemed to symbolize the all American male. Kids pretended to be him as they played their Sandlot games and dreamed of future glory. Good looking, funny, and macho to the core, Mickey Mantle seemed bigger than life. Not all was as rosy as it seemed, however. Behind the line drives and the laughter, Mickey was a troubled man. One of the sources of this was his certainty that his days were numbered. His dad had died of Hodgkin's disease at 39, and two uncles also died in their early 40s of other forms of cancer. Joe Pepitone recalled that Mantle used to stay up and talk about being afraid of dying young. Never more than nominally religious, he had no answer to the reality of death, and it seemed to haunt him all his days. A second pressure that he faced was the immense expectations that surrounded him nearly all of his life. Even as a child, his father would practice with him for hours after work and tell him he would become the best baseball player that ever was. In his first spring training with the Yankees, nearly half a million people came out to see the game, something unheard of at that time. In his later years, he would write, When I was a rookie, Casey Stingle had said this guy's going to be better than Joe DiMaggio and Babe Ruth. It did not happen. Whether it was from the fear of death or the expectations he had always lived with or some other inexplicable reason, Mickey Mantle soon started what was to be a lifelong pattern of alcohol abuse when he first came to the Yankees. In his autobiography, The Mick, he writes Parties, flashy people, hard liquor. Staying out really late. Billy and I were often the life of the party. We wouldn't go upstairs to our old room until we were just about ready to drop. While it seemed a glamorous life to a naive young ball player, it gradually evolved to something that got ugly and at times dangerous. One evening during the off season, as he left his house, his wife asked him how long he would be. He told her just a couple of hours. Instead, he drank all night and then he went on a fishing trip with some friends he met without even telling his wife. Two days later, he showed up at home with a nice catch of fish to find his wife, Merlin, frantic with worry. She cried to him, How can you do this to me? But he shrugged and went to bed without explanation. After retirement from baseball, the drinking seemed to get worse. In an article he did for Sports Illustrated, he wrote, I found friends at bars and I filled my emptiness with alcohol. As he grew older and the glory years receded further and further into the past, Mickey began to reap a bitter harvest from the hedonistic seeds he had so diligently sowed. He began having memory lapses to the point where he wondered if he had Alzheimer's disease. The doctor said his liver had been so damaged it was like one glob of scar tissue. He began having anxiety attacks. His normally pleasant personality became surly and obnoxious at times. And finally, he checked himself into the Betty Ford Center and gave up drinking altogether. But it was too late. The cancer that he'd always feared first struck his liver. 
As he neared the end of his life, Mantle became keenly aware of the way he had wasted his life and failed his family. And he said, My kids have never blamed me. They don't have to. I blame myself. At a press conference following his surgery for liver replacement, Mantle spoke to the kids, and he told them, Don't be like me. God gave me a body and the ability to play baseball. I had everything, and I just... And at that point, he threw up his hands and bowed his head. Those who knew Mantle well saw behind the facade of laughter to a man who was never really at peace with himself. The sportscaster Bob Costas, who got close to Mantle in his latter years, made mention of this when he interviewed Mickey just after he was treated for alcoholism. Costas said, I've always had the sense there was a sadness about you. Was that true? Mantle answered, Yeah, I think that when I did drink a little too much or something, it kind of relieved the tension that I felt within myself, maybe because I hadn't been what I should have been. In the back of my mind, I feel like I've let everybody down some way or other. As Mickey came face to face with the end of his life and his body filled with a rapidly spreading cancer, he called on his old friend and teammate, Bobby Richardson, asking for his prayers. Like Mickey, Bobby had been an outstanding athlete and a tough ball player for the Yankees in their glory years, but that's where the similarities ended. Throughout his baseball career, Bobby had been a committed Christian who had placed faith and family above baseball, and Bobby encouraged Mickey to receive Christ as his Savior. Not long after that, when it became evident that Mickey would die in the next few days, Bobby went back to the hospital to see Mickey. The familiar grin he had seen during all those locker room pranks in his playing days was back on Mickey's face, but this time for a wholly different reason. Mickey's first words were, Bobby, I receive Christ as my Savior. Taking nothing for granted, Bobby went over God's plan of salvation with Mickey, sharing with him how that Jesus had taken our sins upon himself on the cross and had paid the debt we could never pay by dying in our place and then had risen from the dead. He told Mickey how we must receive Christ by faith, trusting in him alone for justification in the sight of God, and Mickey assured Bobby that he had done this. And when Bobby's wife came into the room later on, she also wanted confirmation that Mickey really understood the gospel. So she asked Mickey Mantle, and if God should ask you, why should I allow you into heaven? What would you answer? Mickey knew that he would never make it by his own good deeds, and his reply gave evidence that he had truly understood the gospel. Mickey told her, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 